Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Erin Nevius. I'm ACRL's content strategist. And in celebration of Peer Review Week 2021, this is ACRL Presents Opening Peer Review in LIS. As Alois said, today's session is being recorded, and we'll post the recording on ACRL's YouTube channel and link to it from our website. Please make sure your chat box is set to go to all presenters and attendees and add any questions you have throughout the presentation. There will be a Q&A portion at the end and they'll be addressed then. I am very pleased to welcome today's presenter, Emily Ford, Urban and Public Affairs Librarian at Portland State University and author of ACRL's recently published Stories of Open, Opening Peer Review Through Narrative Inquiry. The book is available in print and open access editions from the ALA store and it's the first book to go through ACRL's Publications and Librarianship book series open peer review process. This is a free webcast and ACRL's other free professional development opportunities are made possible in part by your ACRL membership, which helps fund many of our programs and services for the academic and research library community. Not a member? Join nearly 10,000 of your colleagues and become a member today. Visit ala.org slash ACRL slash membership for more information. Emily, thank you for being here and feel free to start when you're ready. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Alois. Uh, just, um, I think y'all can hear me and see my screen. Um, just before I dive in a few logistics, uh, sometimes there's noise coming from my house, um, either cats or pet rats, and um, the rats are next to me to the left, and they make a lot of noise sometimes with their um, paper, and this is a time of day when they're awake. So, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and then the other thing, like, please um, chatter amongst amongst yourselves in the chat. I can see it, and I love to see uh, interaction and what's what's happening. So I'm super pleased to be here. Um, I'm wearing my hard pants, a term I just learned yesterday, and I feel really behind the times. Um, I got my Zoom lighting on and here we are a year and a half into a pandemic learning how to <laughs> still use Zoom. So today um, I'm gonna be talking about, um, oh, I'm glad someone else is with me. Hasn't heard that term. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. So before I really uh, begin, I wanna um, give a land acknowledgement for where I sit um, uh, and also a little bit about uh, my uh, physical environment and worldview. I sit on the lands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. I acknowledge that I'm here today because of the many sacrifices forced upon these peoples and their ancestors. Um, that's a uh, picture of the Columbia River here in Oregon. I am a white cisgendered heterosexual woman. I believe in intersectional feminism. I uh, believe that knowledge is never concrete constantly shifting and that knowledge cannot be separated from our physical and psychic experiences. And um, this is just to share my perspective and especially since uh, the theme of peer review week is about identity and peer review, all of things, these things kind of fall in. I've been researching peer review and open peer review since 2008 and I'm excited to kind of talk about identity today. And I hope that you're here with your many identities um, as well. So uh, just a, a plug as to uh, why this fits in with the theme of peer review week. I just wanna show the um, book that was recently published. Um, there's two chapters, perhaps three that are the most germane to this particular topic this week um, of the roles of peer review and the dualities and multiplicities in, in peer review. And what I mean by dualities and multiplicities in chapter five um, is really the dualities and multiplicities of the roles and the identities in those roles. So um, several years ago, I think it was Chris Borg was um, giving a presentation and I, I could be misremembering, but um, Chris challenged us to think about the many identities that we felt today I am or I am a. And this was my um, brainstorm list from about seven o'clock this morning here uh, Pacific time. And um, the point is, is that the, the list is changes every day and you might write it down differently every day. Uh, the thing about these lists of identity, uh, sometimes some of these things are true for us and sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes they're not the same thing. So like one of the things that 
I noticed when I was looking at this was that I identify as a Jew, I identify as an atheist, and I identify as an atheist Jew, and those are all three separate things in my mind. So um, just I identity is amorphous. So let's, um, I'm going to give you about 30, 30 seconds, think about how you identify today as a human being. <clears throat> and if you want to share, feel free in the chat. Okay, so I'll move on. Tired all the time. <laughs> yeah, I can't see everything. I don't know if you send it to everybody um, just in the chat. So tired all the time, that's kind of a pandemic thing. <laughs> cognitive, cognitive functioning doesn't always work um, for me sometimes. So let's, let's move on um, to talk about peer review. Uh, but actually, it might be nice if if you had answers to these questions, like what is peer review and what does it do? Feel free to answer in the chat if you have any thoughts. Quality check, mechanism of quality assurance. Kathy's saying it's an opportunity to clarify what an author is communicating. <clears throat> Gatekeeping is something that I've heard before, whether or not we agree with that. It's supposed to help good science, boost confidence and accuracy. Validation of the research by other researchers. The methods are sound a lot. I hear, I've heard that a lot, sound methods. Something uh, that has come up for me in a lot of my research is that um, I've heard people use it as developmental or mentorship. Um, nothing lives in a vacuum, yep. Yep. Peer review traditionally was, I think, um, a gatekeeping function. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, there's an image I like of Sir Isaac Newton presiding over the Royal Society. Um, peer review used to be a collaborative effort of the Royal Society. Um, it is a relatively new construct for uh, blind or double blind peer review that came more in the 60s and 70s when journal publishing became a really big kind of proprietary um, uh, enterprise. I guess enterprise is the right word since it was a capitalistic approach. Um, and uh, journals and publishers wanted to be able to sell uh, to libraries and peer review was seen as like a marketing something that helped market it. Um, system worth, Tarita, thank you for that. A system worth reimagining, amen. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, in the 60s and 70s, this is kind of how peer review was reinvigorated and seen in, in, and more in this, this double blind or opaque um, process. Um, and that, that knowledge that I have comes from Eileen Fife um, and the research group in the UK. Um, there's a great white paper that was published. You can find it untangling academic publishing, which talks about that history. Um, so like I said, collaboration and mentoring is something that we're seeing develop. Um, I think that peer review uh, also can create a robust discussion around things, particularly in new, new imaginings or reimaginings of it. Um, so I want to 
say uh, when I look at peer review, it's, it is inherently tied, at least in this context, to research. And I see research as a human endeavor. I see our discipline in LIS as one that is human focused. Um, and therefore, uh, it's taking me back to my logic days, you know, the three, tri the triangle with the three dots. Therefore, peer review is also human centered. Um, and I'm not sure that necessarily bench science researchers or quantitative researchers would necessarily agree with that um, uh, logical flow. But um, I see that since it's so humanistic um, and I am a, more of a qualitative researcher, I also like to tie it into love and the, the feminist love that we hear about um, from Bell Hooks. Um, particularly when in teaching critical thinking, um, she says genuine learning like love is always mutual. Um, and bell hooks again, uh, there can be no love where there is domination. So peer review um, for me comes into tension with those two things with the domination. Um, uh, and then also, uh, you know, how do we have a mutual love? Um, Bell Hooks doesn't specifically speak about peer review, of course, it's in, in um, this discourse on teaching critical thinking, but I also feel like research is learning. So that's the connection for me there. Um, so I can see that peer review would be a practice of love if, if you follow with me. So just something to think about. Um, but peer review doesn't it's not on its own, right? Like this fern that's unfurling, it um, it needs lots of other things. So ferns need air, they need sunlight, they need water, they need soil, they need worm poop, you know, all of the things um, that help ferns grow and unfurl and become these uh, beautiful forest uh, plants that we see when we walk through the woods, at least here in the in the US. So even if um, in peer review, thinking about um, an author publication, even if someone's a solo author, that work did not happen alone, right? Um, that that author definitely had had support. So let's think through that a little bit. Let's go through uh, the roles of peer review. Let's do some more um, brainstorming here in the chat, if you could, what the roles are in peer review processes. And I would like to point out this, this image is um, uh, bringing from my past, this, this image is from a, a production of Mother Courage um, by Brecht. Um, and no, I'm not, I, I studied uh, a, a playwright in college, German, Jewish playwright. <clears throat> so what roles exist in the peer review process? Reviewers and authority. Author, reviewer too. Oh, sure. <laughs> I love reviewer too. Author, editor, reviewer, peer reviewers. What about readers? Copy editor. Yep. Maybe your friend who read your article before you submitted it. We could be loosey goosey here. That colleague that asks you to review for them. Yep. <laughs> yep. I think we've all had that, Amy. So I distilled it pretty um, in, in, in my work, or I think more what I'll talk about today. Um, these definitions of, or how I've discussed these in the book, Stories of Open, um, you'll see on your screen. So the role of an author would be the primary content creator, new ideas and knowledge. Um, traditionally, a reviewer reads and examines submitted manuscripts, um, suggestions, et cetera. And then the editor, um, daily operations. And sometimes there's a managing editor and then the big editor, you know, it depends on the, on the publication. But I, I also kind of want to challenge this simplicity that I introduced here with the reviewer, because I feel like in that process, oftentimes there's a lot of intellectual content um, and thinking and labor that goes uh, into um, reviewing a piece. And, and you as a reviewer might be offering a whole new idea or a whole new direction, which 
can be hard <laughs> as an author <laughs> if you, if your research is suggested to go in a different direction <laughs> in the peer review process we may have had that before um, but uh, or an expansion on, on what's happening there so there's actually quite a bit of labor that's happening and it's it's not transparent it's hidden labor and I think the editors also provide a lot of hidden labor as well as copy editors um, in this process. And if we're in an opaque process, which a lot of people call double blind, again, I, I think that's an ableist term. So I, I like I prefer to say opaque and opaque processes. Um, the reader public uh, only benefits from that robust discussion if there was one in as much as uh, what is apparent in the outcome of the published piece. So the discussion about how to get to that point, so the path isn't there and can't invite in as much conversation. So um, my work in this book was based on a series of 10 interviews, 10 long form interviews, and I um, wanted to share some of these uh, things that folks said to me about their identities. Um, so one of the really interesting things, Alma, these are all pseudonyms, by the way, Alma um, said a part of her identity is that as a co-author and Alma was not the only one who identified in this way. I also had a participant named Nancy who was um, working on a sabbatical project and, and spoke to me about how she felt like um, she had to be doing a sabbatical project by herself or it wouldn't get approved and um, was having a hard time with that sabbatical project because she hadn't been a solo author in so long and identified so clearly as a researcher as a co-author or a collaborator that um, she was getting stuck, which I think is a really interesting way to identify and have our identity in this process. Um, Nancy um, offers that uh, the role of a peer reviewer is to offer what's going to make this strong enough to be published. And then Kurt looked at editor at, at editorship as a mentoring role. And um, many other folks did also talk about peer review as a mentoring role. Um, Julie, uh, one participant, talked about really wanting to be an informal and formal um, mentor for folks in, in the peer review and was um, very generous in her comments and said she was always very thorough in her reports in that she didn't really care if the author took the, those reports and didn't publish in a journal. She just wanted the author to really have those ideas and thoughts to really make the work strong and support authors in that way. So um, there's a lot more behind the way we see our identities as an author, editor, or reviewer. Um, so it's not just I'm an author or Emily the presenter or Alma the co-author. There's a lot more that, that goes into it. And again, because we talk about identity, these things are amorphous, right? Maybe today I identify as an, as an author of books and tomorrow I identify as like someone who can't, <laughs> can't string a sentence together. <laughs> so um, what do you all identify with if you feel like sharing in the chat? Um, in, in the peer review process. The newbie. Does anyone feel like they identify as an imposter? All of it, Miriam, Scott, author, co-author, idea person. Yes. I want to feel like an imposter. Yes, yes, yes. Me too. Always, always. I do too. Um, Anders, thank you. Yes, imposters. Yeah. How do we get here in academia with, I, I, miss, I guess I'm assuming we're all academic librarians and that's an assumption. You know what they say about assumptions, make an ass of, of you. But um, I think especially in our, in our field, when uh, a lot of us don't have PhDs, some of us might have master's degrees in other disciplines, or we might not even have finished the library degree and, and are working in a library in an academic setting. Um, so in, in academia, that can lead to a lot of feelings of imposterism. Um, in my, my personal experience, fortunately, I grew up and was raised by academics, so I understood the academic unfolding of life and it was around me um, a lot of people don't grow up with that and so there's even that level of imposterism or feeling um, 
a long time ago, Jad Abumrad was a keynote speaker at ACRL. I don't know if you all remember this. It was in Indy, Indianapolis. It was many years ago, right at the beginning of my career. And I remember I love Radio Lab and I love that podcast and, and radio show so much. And I remember hearing Jad Abumrad saying that he felt like he was an imposter <laughs> speaking to the librarian. So I don't think that as established as any of us are in our careers, whether we are um, about, about to not be employed anymore because we're retiring or whether we're new, I think we all experience this. Um, Julie, one participant um, that I spoke with, the one who sees, sees herself as a mentor, told me even though that she is a full professor and has had this career of like editing books and writing articles, she still felt every day like an imposter. So um, these feelings and this affect, um, this affective learning, it, it never really goes away. So one of the questions that I also ask, and um, maybe we don't have to chat about this one as much, um, but what power do these roles innately have um, of author, editor, and reviewer? Please feel free to put your thoughts in chat. Gatekeeping, yep. Selection bias, editors could have a uh, power of selection bias, not even sending something out for review. Creative power of the author. Thank you, Scott, for pointing that out. In some situations, reviewers have the power to suggest, um, to accept or reject, right? And the editor may take that or not take that power of whether something gets accepted. Experience and access. I'm not sure what you mean by access, Christy, if you wanna um, further explain that in chat. Yeah, 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 thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, you bring up a very good point. Um, oh yes, the power of citation too, and thank you for, for contributing that. Um, I have enormous privilege to have written this book because I am a, in a tenured position at a university that has librarians who have academic rank and status, and that I had the financial privilege um, to be able to take a year off and do this research and do this work. And I had the privilege in my job to make it a priority in that autonomy. Um, uh, the resources for grant funding um, at community colleges, as you point out, could be one thing. I mean, there's there's so much privilege that um, academics have in their lives. And absolutely, Christy, thank you so much. Um, the power of citation, Lynn, I wanna kind of circle back to that too. Authors have the power to cite, right? Authors have the power to, cite folks or not cite folks. Um, but then you also have a review process. I don't know how many of you have had the experience of, well, did you consider citing this paper? <laughs> and in an opaque process, who wrote that paper? Is it the reviewer saying you should cite my work, right? <laughs> Um, is that the reviewer too who does that? Um, so yeah, but we do have that power. And, and one of the um, one of the interviewees, Nancy, actually explicitly talked about that in our conversation. Um, she was talking about how she was very cognizant of who she's citing um, and what these people's life experiences were that she, uh, to the best of her ability, right? Like, was she citing um, the Sir Isaac Newtons or was she citing the Kimberly Crenshaws, right? Um, yeah, so I'm gonna move on. Um, here is this, uh, and uh, those of you who are my Facebook friends may have uh, seen me asking about um, creatures, real or imagined, that were like half one thing, half another, like interspecies. 
animals. Um, and here's a griffin. Go griffins. Um, uh, griffin was a, a good suggestion. I think one of you here made that suggestion for me. Um, but I, I, you know, the point here, the other things that we, um, you know, uh, Spock, right? Spock is um, half Vulcan, half human. There's another um, Vulcan, I forget her name. It was also half human. Deanna Troy was half human, half Betazoid. Um, there's other, like a Liger. Um, anyway, uh, in our roles in, in publishing and peer review, we, we inhabit them at the same time or maybe not at the same time. We're multiple things at once. So our world experience and our, our experience in the roles kind of all coalesce, right? So a griffin is not necessarily a lion and an eagle. It's both at the same time. So I just kind of want to bookmark that for yourself a little bit. Um, so let's dive into some theory. Um, there's there's two particular bits of theory about identity when it comes to peer review and that, that I explored a little bit in, in professional identities. Connolly and Clinton have um, greatly influenced my research and work. Not only did they um, write, uh, edit this book about um, professional identity um, for teachers, their educational researchers, um, their work in, in the in the late 90s, um, uh, but they viewed identity as a parade. Um, so our professional identities are like interconnected in the in the parade of experience. So um, it shifts, it changes, it marches on, you know, you know, the way the parades is a whole body, like sometimes it gets like, um, like really tight in one spot, and then it snakes out really long and skinny, um, and, and how we are in that. Um, and then there, there's new possibilities. And, um, you know, at the end of this quote, um, new possibilities might be canceling out others. So maybe that marching band is really, really, really loud and you can't hear um, somebody behind them and that's okay. But then you might eventually hear the person, the, the group behind them or not, um, if that metaphor works <laughs> for y'all. So I just kind of wanted to throw out their theory from Connolly and Clendenin about like identity and professional identity. There's one more theorist that I want to point out, also publishing at the same time that Connolly and Clendenin's book came out in 1999, um, is uh, the theory of sub-identities. So um, this book by uh, Elliot Mishler is, um, was about artists' identities, so the professional identities of artists, and it was a, a study um, where the metaphor for Mishler is singing. And I um, just wanna give a shout out to the PSU uh, choir and the award-winning choir at Portland State University who's, um, they're pictured here, um, singing. So um, it's, you know, this comes back to phen phenomenology or our life experience or lived experiences. Um, who do you bring to the table at any given time, right? So then there's this question, what if we brought multiple identities to the peer review process? Um, the folks I chatted with, so uh, these are just some choice quotes. Stephanie, the more I review, the better my writing process is. And I heard that from many, many, many people. Um, some of the folks that I continue to interview and publish their, their transcripts on my website, stories of open, storiesofopen.org, um, have also talked about this, that, that the, Almost like the like if you think about threshold concepts, right? Like once you know what it is to be an editor, you can't unknow that work. Once you know what it is to be a peer reviewer, you can't unknow that work, whether or not you're you're serving in that role at any given time, right? So once I know, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Once I know what it is to be a very good guardian of of pet rats, I can't unknow what that looks like, and I bring that piece of my identity to me with me. Um, to the table, and it might be way back there, or it might come to the fore. Um, Bethany really thinks about the way things are edited now after having served as a, as a journal co-editor. So that that um, is something to think about. And then and then um, I think this this quote from Kurt. You know, our discussion was really interesting um, because he talks about you know, editing and refereeing are part of a continuum, right? So what's the role of the editor versus the referee? Um, and then where is the author in that in that role too, right? So if you've served as an editor or reviewer, you have that knowledge, like that's going to come in even when you're authoring um, at, at some point or when you're giving informal feedback to a colleague, <laughs> right? When they ask you to read this thing you're about to submit. Um, 
yeah, so not really being able to divorce one from the other um, and then being put in this position where like, okay, you're a, a, a reviewer. And so are you really copy editing right now? You may be asked to do that or you may not. And so how do you kind of present as a referee or how do you present as an editor um, in that role or even an author? So what if we openly disclose these identities, what would happen? Would the world shatter? <laughs> um, and feel free again, chatter amongst yourselves and chat. Um, if you have any thoughts about what would happen, what would happen if, if I showed up to, to referee something and I said, my name is Emily and I work at Portland State University. Um, this is my research. Uh, like, um, I, I'm a feminist, uh, you know, things like that, or ooh, ooh, we could get, hate, we could get hate mail, Scott. Um, what would, what would happen? Um, Julie talked to me about a process that she and her co-editors used, used for a book to kind of create a community of practice. And um, I really liked this phrase that she used, a constellation of thought. So in, in their process, what they, what they did is they asked um, a book chapter editors, would they be willing to also take a look at and offer comments on a different chapter that was being um, created for the book? And when she was talking about this process, she felt like the feedback from her co-editors and then also the authors in the book, just uh, it, she felt like everything coalesced for her seeing all of that feedback with multiple voices that you could have a constellation of thought around something. And so that robust practice, which they could all read and they could all share. So in a typical opaque peer review process, a referee doesn't get to see what the other, other referee says until it's been, at least it, depending on where, where you're refereeing, you might not see the other referees comments at all, or you might only see them once the report is sent back to the authors. In my experience, my uh, most recent um, refereeing experience has been with um, PLOS One. And uh, I, I, I like reviewing there because um, it is an open peer review process and um, I've been asked back, which is nice, but um, at the end, I, I sign my reviews, but I can also see what the other um, referees said. And I like that. And then if I'm invited to review something that has been um, an r and or revise and resubmit, I get to see that past feedback as well. Um, when I see it again. So I get to, to interact with it that way. Other, other journals might be using like Google Docs so you could do it in real time. I know that's what happens in the library with the lit pipe um, uh, and other things. So what if, what if we brought our, our selves, our full selves? What if we brought our abled bodied selves or disabled bodied selves? Or what if we brought our, um, our neurodiversity forward, or what if we brought um, our gender identities um, forward, right? Like, what would that do to peer review? And what would that do to research? I don't necessarily have an answer, but I have thoughts. Um, and then I want to offer you, um, this is my last slide and I have more time for questions than I was asked to have, but that was intentional. Um, for your aspirational reading list, this is not a complete list and it's not in any order. It is um, seven o'clock in the morning today, um, going through my Zotero library, things that are germane. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm ready, Erin, for us to open it up for a discussion. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. And um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So I will kick us off because um, I'm very curious. I, what are your thoughts? What are, what do you see as the benefits of bringing your identities to editorial processes? Thanks for asking. I mean, I think, um, you know, everybody has to, to think for themselves about this. I can see where people might not feel safe bringing their full selves um, to a process, either as an author, editor, or referee. But I do think it can um, 
really pay tribute to the human experience of what it means to be a human and what it means to be a human doing research. Um, and I think that just comes from my, my perspective of being a phenomenological researcher in that, in that way. I think that we are richer and can create more human connection if we bring our, as much of our hearts forward. Um, and for me, my heart is entwined with who I am and how I'm identifying. Um, that being said, again, safety is a thing and, and, um, needing, needing to be professional too, right? Like, um, you know, certainly there, there are bound, boundaries, <laughs> boundaries exist for a reason and we should all have them. Um, and I'm very aware of my privilege as a, a white person and as a straight person and as, um, someone with a lot of class privilege that I can be sitting here saying these things, because for me, it's relatively safe to bring myself, um, forward in this, but I do think that it can make um, the discussion deeper. I think it can make it more robust. Um, and uh, I think that one of the issues that we, we have in peer review is that it has been and still continues to be gatekeeping and so people are excluded and so the more that we can like try and offer the different identities um the more we can see where we need to be more inclusive and where we need to be doing a lot more equity work i see that scott says don't we always bring our whole selves to the review process whether we admit it or not um i think it depends on your approach as a human being i mean there might be things where um like if you're asked to do opaque review, perhaps there's things about your experience in, in gender or in ability um, that are not brought to the fore. And I'm not saying everyone needs to disclose all of this, um, but I think there's things that could be more overt or your institutional affiliation or things like that that also come into play and do have um, things to do with power dynamics and bias. And um, so that's another thing that, um, to speak to what you were asking, Erin, is that if we're more open, we can identify more biases. And I think everything is biased. Yes, Lynn, you're asking about um, impact factor as a metric in hiring and promotion. Do you see any relationship between this kind of push against traditional metrics and the push for open peer review? Um, yeah, totally. And, and, um, you know, at where I am at Portland State University, at least in the library, like we've looked at impact factor and been, ha ha, <laughs> right? I think as librarians, um, we, we understand that. And it depends on the culture of your institution. And I think it depends on the culture of the processes. Like at Portland State, our, our promotion and tenure process is such that it's within the library, um, This the recommendations are made, but I know there are librarians and um, other universities where, it's not just librarians that are on the committee, it's like a committee of faculty senate. And so that the different cultures of the different academic disciplines kind of go in there. Um, the other thing I would say about like open peer review, if you can openly share your comments as a referee, you can look at that work as a piece of scholarship and intellectual labor. Um, so I know that for PLOS One, there is a DOI assigned to a referee report. And you can, um, and F, uh, wait, no, it's F1000 Research has a DOI and it will show up in your ORCID profile. If you have an ORCID and then um, I found a way I manually added um, my open uh, reviewer reports to my ORCID profile from PLOS because you can find them. <laughs> like I had to dig, but I manually added them because I do feel like that's um, labor and it should be acknowledged and recognized. Um, and so that kind of goes into the PNT process. Does that kind of answer what I was talking about, Lynn? Okay, great. I have another question. While the chat is gearing up, um, Emily, from your point of view, do you see, I can say from where I sit, the pandemic has broken down some of those traditional 
boundaries, I think. I feel like as, you know, I'm the book publisher for ACRL, we work together on your book, Stories of Open. I feel like it's forced us to be a bit more honest about where we are in the world as we're attempting to do our work. Um, and I'm wondering if you're seeing the same kinds of things. Yeah, I feel, you know, you all are peering into my home office, right? I had to make sure there was no you know, mess on the chair behind me, like stacks of papers and stuff. Like, I think our, our boundaries have definitely gotten fuzz, <laughs> fuzzier. Um, yeah. And I think that people are being more open about like, well, how am I today? I'm pandemic fine. Right. Like pandemic fine is also a new, a newer phrase. <laughs> I'm pandemic fine. Uh, if you mean like I'm having some crippling anxiety and I can't sleep and and, uh, <laughs> and like, oh my gosh, what about this Delta variant? And is it safe to like hug my friend? And <laughs> right. Like, I feel like we're having this shared human experience. So we are kind of breaking down the boundaries of, um, that, that, that self. Um, and I think it can be more humanistic. Um, does that make sense, Aaron? I don't know if that's what you're asking. No, it's, it's exactly what I'm asking. It's, it's just really interesting. I, and obviously I'm coming at this from a point of privilege and it, um, it's easy for me to sit on my side of the desk as an editor and say, this feels more collaborative because I understand it can still be an intimidating relationship, but I appreciate having you know, more honesty with my authors um, because you know, like you said, we're having this human experience and it's been very interesting. I've, you know, I've been a book editor for 20 years. It's been one of the more interesting periods that I've done this work. Yeah. I mean, we're li living through, I want to say a singular experience, but it's not singular. I want to acknowledge that Gurr put in the um, chat that peer review feels punitive. And I absolutely agree um, that in traditional ways, like opaque peer review does, that's that gatekeepy punitive thing, like you're not good enough. And I think that's, um, you know, I've, I, in talking to people about how they learn to peer review is also a uh, uh, interesting right because I think in some potentially in some disciplines the culture is let me poke holes in this and how punitive can I be can I prove them wrong right it's kind of like that tough love thing um and that's not uh, a value that I see in librarianship and I would be sad <laughs> if that's the way people were appro approaching peer review particularly or particularly in our publications um and I think that open peer review does generate discussion. Um, and so, yeah, looking to, okay, yes. So there's uh, the internet has taught us that anonymous mark can be problematic. Yes, Scott, the internet has taught us that. Never read the comments um, about some post about ivermectin or whatever, <laughs> or any post about vaccines. Um, uh, the potential of looking stupid if participating in open peer review. Well, Carrie, thank you. Um, well, I don't know if you're here at the beginning, we were talking about imposter feeling, feeling like an imposter. Um, and I'm wondering if Carrie, if you're talking about someone who's been identified to be like the referee for a piece of work or a public commenting or both on that question. Both. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally. There's definitely that. And I think the implementations of open peer review that I've seen um, across the disciplines, some of them are, op a lot, most of them, if they exist, are opt in. And so uh, I could see where someone who um, might, might be reticent uh, because they'd be worried about looking stupid. Um, yeah, that's, that's a thing. But I think also um, this goes to our lack of training and how to do peer review. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of disciplines struggle with. I asked a lot of people how you learned, how did you learn to do this? And people are like, I was sent a request and I figured it out. Or like there were some maybe guidelines or, you know, I didn't know what to do. I just modeled what I'd had before. Right. It's a really kind of amorphous thing and how to do it. And I think that this like looking stupid concern could be alleviated if we had some better onboarding or training of what that would look like. So if there's a piece of an article that you can't speak to, you could say, I am not trained in I, 
and I cannot review this particular portion of your method or something like that. So you can actually bring yourself to the fore in that way and say, I'm reviewing only for these particular pieces. And on some level, it's also the editor's job to try and find qualified reviewers, whatever qualified means, if that makes sense. Um, are authors ever allowed to recommend reviewers? Yes, it depends on the journal. Thank you, um, Julie, for asking that. Yeah, and I think sometimes people are also, you know, depending on what kind of thing is getting reviewed, you can also say people who you don't want want to review or people who might have bias, you have to um, do some of those disclosures. And, it, and it's different journal to journal and publication to publication, or if it's a process when it's like a, a promotion and tenure process or like other kinds of peer review, there might be other mechanisms for that. Um, I know that um, at, and I'm using in the library with the lead pipe as an example, because I, I was one of the co-founders, so I know it well, and that's that's why I bring this up. I know that traditionally when we, we, we asked people to recommend people they thought would be good to review their work. So that does happen at least at that journal. I know that. Um, yes, Christy, everything you said, 100%. And I guess for the sake of the recording, I should say that um, Peer review can feel like a very exclusive process um, and it leaves people out, um, especially those at community colleges who are uh, people who are serving underserved populations. And that's hundred percent true. Yeah, the system is, is not made, for, the system was built around gatekeeping. It was not built around inclusivity and equity. Um, and yet we still hold on to it as the marker of whether something's of quality. So how can we, take this paradox and make it work for us. And Tarita, um, thank you for um, complimenting my point. Um, you can always say, no, I'm not gonna review that thing. I've done that before. I cannot, no, I would love to review this paper that has a Bayesian analysis, but I'm not an economist or a statistician and I can't look at that. <clears throat> Has anyone ever had a reviewer two experience? Has anyone ever felt like they maybe were the reviewer two accidentally? I have, that was a really crappy feeling. I found myself saying, well, you could have restructured your study to do it this way. <laughs> that was early on in my experience, but um, I do not like the fact that I identify with that. I think that's something that we should uh, maybe acknowledge that sometimes we don't like the things that we're identifying as. Oh, thank you, Tarita. Put it, uh, Tarita put in the chat the link to the anti-racist um, scholarly reviewing practices. Um, it's an openly shared Google Doc. <laughs> thank you, Kathy, for admitting it. <laughs> yeah, it's such a bummer. Oh, so this is really interesting, Kathy, that you say you, reviewer two um, made some good points because in a lot of the folks that I've been chatting with and I ask about like the negative, if they had negative experiences with referees, um, a lot of the people come back with like, well, 
when I first read the review, I was so mad and they were a reviewer too, and they just didn't get it, blah, 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 blah. And then I reread it six months later and I was like, oh, they had a point. Oh, they were just trying to help. So, you know, how much of, of this myth of the reviewer too is, um, is feelings. Um, and that sounds kind of victim blamey because I think that there's a way to offer feedback that is um, constructive and helpful and filled with and, and, and to be an act of love. But I think, again, that's where we lack this training, right? Where we think we're supposed to poke holes in something when that's not actually the point. At least in my view, that's not what peer review should be for. Yeah, yep. Anonymous reviews, um, Miss Tone, right? So if you can't bring your personal self to it, to a review, if you can't say, in my experience as an instruction librarian at this university, where the the demographic is such, where um, if you're you're reviewing an article that's about um, first gen students or DACA students or something like that, right? Um, some of that get, might get masked. Out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you meant by tone. Scott, thank you for sharing that experience. Yeah, I that's that's where um, the editorial role comes in, right? If the editor wanted you to revise something and resubmit it, it's on the editor um, to decide whether they want to listen to that review or not. Thank you for sharing your experience, Ryan. Yep, yep, we're coming from influences how the advice is given and received. Yep, 100%. Um, Ryan, the approach that you're, you're talking about, um, yeah, totally. And I've heard that from a lot of people, like, remember, these are people you're talking to in, in reviewing. And I think when you, when everything is opaque, it's a lot easier, right? It's like, you could be the troll on the internet, like don't read the comments because you have an alias and you're protected, protected, um, um, from not being as loving or as kind. Um, it's a lot easier to not be loving and kind when in, you have a veil of opacity. Um, and I think also one of the problems with reviewer two, at least in my book, I talk about the reviewer two in the book. And I think the conclusion I came to is that reviewer two is not, um, at least in our profession, not necessarily ill will. Uh, certainly, unfortunately, there probably are some people <laughs> um, with ill will or an ax to grind. But generally, I think it's overworked, underappreciated, underpaid people who realized, oh no, I said I would do this thing. Where is the time in the day to do this thing? Oh, and I haven't had the training to do it as well as I could. So that's what I think of reviewer two and LIS. which has everything to do with, I think, personal identity in um, peer review. Well, we've got about five more minutes. So any last questions, pop those into the chat. And Emily, is there, is there any last thoughts you wanna leave us with or? I guess I uh, didn't really talk a lot about 
um, what open peer review looks like in LIS right now. Um, but I would say one of the major uh, themes that I've kind of been trying to explore in my brain is, is this transparency piece of every process that we have. So we can bring our identities forward, but that's only one piece of the puzzle to opening peer review. Um, so there is this thread with the identity, but there's so much else that goes to it, right? Like is, do we know what happens once a paper gets submitted? Do we know how many referees are asked to review that paper? Do we know what the guidelines that referees are being asked to use are? Um, do referees even have guidelines that they're being asked to use? Um, has there been some norming happening at the journal? Who makes the actual decision, <laughs> right? Like, does the editor just take the, dis the decision recommended to them and, and go with that call? Or do they, you know, do some stepping in there, right? Like, there's just so many different pressure points that happen in a process. And, and on top of that, there is a uh, uh, good communication practices have to happen. Even you can have a, tr a process be as transparent as possible and the most transparent is crystal clear as a mountain lake. <laughs> However, <laughs> if, um, if somebody fails at, at communicating or doesn't do the best job in communicating, then that transparency is moot. There is an example from Alma Alma uh, in our conversation was talking about how she had um, agreed to review a paper and the deadline was coming up and she emailed the editor about five times asking for an extension and never heard back from the editor. And that's frustrating. <laughs> so I have on the um, aspirational reading list, um, there's, let's see, the um, article with uh, the Sarah Hare, um, Kara Evanson, Wendy Casper, John Budd, and myself um, was an editorial in CNRL, and it talked about the experimental um, open peer review process or developmental peer review process we used at CNRL several years ago. Um, so that's worth reading um, to kind of think about what it looks like, and I would encourage folks to kind of explore journals um, that do have open peer reviews on them. So like F1000 Research, eLife does some of it, um, PLOS One, um, where you can read uh, reviewer reports and just kind of see what's out there. And thank you for all of your identities and bringing your full selves here today. Thank you so much, Emily. That was wonderful. Thank you everyone for coming and being so engaged. This was such a thoughtful session and we really appreciate it. Um, and check out Emily's book, Stories of Open, it's available in print from the ALA store and in an open access electronic edition. I can't recommend it enough, but I am clearly biased. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.